Welcome, welcome everyone to the industry panel of this um, DTL conference 2015. Um, I want to welcome you to the third pillar of, of DTL. If we could uh, think of um, Data Transparency Lab in terms of the things that are needed for actually making a difference in, in data transparency in the personal use of data online. I would kind of like to, to, to work with you through uh, assigning each of the words in Data Transparency Lab to each of the tracks we actually think of running. So lab would be, of course, related to the, to the research, transparency to the policy, and data to the asset in question. So that is, that is a kind of a way of thinking through it. And then, of course, the missing link is the users. How do you, how do you actually make sense of making things uh, understandable for them? And we'll have some of that covered here today because the, this, this industry panel goes, um, goes as a complement, basically, to, to the policy and to the research, which uh, if we don't bring all these conversations together, what we would have is three different silos, three different ivory towers, which don't necessarily need to talk to each other because researchers could be uh, all time um, in, a, in an echo chamber of its own for publishing papers. The policymakers could be writ writing uh, amazing documents and switching them and, and discussing them endlessly. And, uh, yeah, and the industry could be doing as they are doing, whatever they need to do to make money. So uh, we need to connect these things together. And I think that um, this effort of Data Transparency Lab is all about that, connecting building bridges and building understanding between the different, the different elements of the, of the picture. So um, facing this, we, we have an opportunity to, to try to, to shed light on, on with, the, with the help of the tools and the research on what is the actual uh, status right now so that we can start to change it. But before, we need to actually um, be, need to be able in the, to provide evidence in both tools and add data so that policymakers can, can actually use that as weapons to, to, to actually make sense of the, of the policy. So um, I'd like to, to uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, um, Sandy Pentland and the MIT Media Lab for uh, hosting us here. I want to thank um, the Data Transparency Lab coordination team for making this happen because this, this wouldn't happen if uh, all those elements were not there. And um, I want to make just a little note on why it's um, is, is, um, basically important that we, that we have this, um, this uh, reality check. Um, I think that the, the, the point in which we are right now is, um, as, as it was said before, Andreas made us, uh, a number of uh, really good points. Um, it's not going to, it's, it's, it's probably going to, 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 to break from, from, from some, point, some point of view. We can choose to leave it like that, or we can choose to take specific steps in the right direction. So that is all about um, um, today. So we, we, we want to, to make uh, a discussion happen so that um, specific elements, concrete actions, can be expressed in, in how to make this change happen, what makes sense from the point of view of uh, the economics of it, which are the incentives for each of the players to, to actually change what they are doing right now, um, what is the, the force of the users, the people on, on it, and what is, what is the, a potential way forward. And this is in contrast to, uh, it was mentioned yesterday, data transparency in the sense of government data transparency in which I think that it is much more in, a, uh, in an operational state. There's, there's a, a number of tools that you can apply to, to, to have any government uh, information be more transparent. Uh, but uh, it is a political decision for any government or any city to go into open data, to go into data transparency, to be more transparent and to eventually reach the point in which, like we said yesterday, Singapore is having the budget open to public for discussion. That, that, that is something that is in a completely different stage as um, personal data transparency online, which is not there yet in any of the angles. Tools are not there, users are confused, policy is, is just starting to be written, and um, industry is doing something absolutely different. So 
there's a number of elements there that are not in the data transparency when you apply the words personal and online. So with a further ado, I'd like to, to, to go through, through the rock star panel that we have here, introduce them very briefly, and then have them um, uh, introduce themselves. So we'll have um, with us um, Scott Mayer, CEO of Ghostory, and he'll, he'll um, show us who and how is, is actually uh, tracking us. Uh, we'll have Alessandro De Zanke. He is um, representing uh, in the, the publishers. So he is working for News Corp UK, and he'll help us understand that angle. We'll have Matt Travisano. He is the CEO of Grand Data, a company that is specializing in social analytics and social good projects as well, based on, on data, so all of them data driven. We'll have Paolo Ciccarelli, and he's, uh, he's uh, working for the um, user, in, on behalf of the user, trying to understand <laughs> uh, what is the user journey, the user experience, uh, as part of his work as uh, the Faculty of Design in Polytechnico di Milano. And we'll have, finally, Ger Thorpe uh, illustrating us in what is, uh, what is it like to be a data artist in residence for the New York Times. <laughs> and a number of uh, elements of how users can get active in, in, in recovering control of, of the data. So please count if without. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. So first question I have, how many of all of you work in advertising or marketing? If that's your job, not I work for a company that does it. Like I actually have a title of advertising or marketing. One, two. OK, so that's. Three. So that's, I think, the, the starting point for this. Uh, bringing this conversation together is really quite, quite complex. And uh, muchas gracias a, a la empresa de Telefónica. Yo voy a hablar en, en inglés, pero si ustedes tienen preguntas en español, yo voy a tratar de, de ayudar a ustedes. But thanks for having me. Uh, so how many of you know Ghostery? Sweet. All right, pretty good. So for those of you who don't, and I want to thank my friend Andreas uh, for both helping connect me with Daniel and the Telefonica people, and also for leading me to rewrite my entire presentation while he was talking. Because it's actually way worse. Way worse. This is what it actually looks like. OK? It's way, way worse. Now, the good news, of course, for us, we're, like, we're right here, so we count. right? That's the first thing you care about. Uh, but so why is this going on? It's because uh, the business, it's about business incentives. Uh, right here, I'll back up you guys and take a picture of this. This is, uh, he's based here in Boston. The gentleman's name is Scott Brinker. He's thus, I think, the best thinker on the intersection of marketing technology, marketing and technology out there. So here's why. So the number of companies that are in this ecosystem is growing at twice the rate of the money that's being spent. This is, I'm just trying, I'm coming at this from the other side of what Andreas was talking about. So there's so many companies that are chasing the dollars that it just gets more and more complex because it costs you really almost nothing to start a company these days in the marketing technology space. So what that means then, and I think especially from the, the um, Telefonica side or from really any browser maker, is it presents these, these major problems that people are dealing with. Because the, our philosophy at Ghostry is that we're, we're neutral. We provide tools that both businesses and consumers use to have a better digital experience. Or we can also translate that to we try to make the web suck less for everybody. <clears throat> and the problem you have is that all this tech makes, just like Andreas is saying, makes it slow, makes it expensive, especially to consumers. And that's where I think the opportunity is. Because just, I'd say, in the past three to six months, as the, uh, uh, the growth of mobile, and I think going into this holiday shopping season, it will really become apparent. Consumers are now angry. They're not annoyed or scared, they're mad because they have a slow web experience and it's draining their batteries and it's draining their data plans. So they feel it in a way they never have before. Uh, so when I try to explain this to our engineers, uh, having come from, I worked at the New York Times for eight years, I've been in the marketing tech space now for a really long time. Uh, when I'm trying to explain this to both to academics and to, um, <clears throat> um, to, to engineers, why is this so complex? It's really simple. It's a very simple equation. Okay, emotion is always greater than ration. And 
if you want to look at that being played out, we were a part of a content blocker called Peace that was the most popular app in the App Store for about 48 hours. Um, we made a big mistake in launching it the way we did. We ended up, we and the developer pulled it down after 48 hours. But that was a great example of emotion over ration. The number of people that actually installed it was very small. The impact on the overall internet economy, you couldn't even, it was so small you couldn't calculate it. The emotion just <laughs> So as you go through thinking about how to create a better user experience, you have to always have this equation as part of the algorithm. And the reason where I think now it's coming into effect, because it applies both to consumers and to businesses, is that consumers are really mad. This is from the New York Times, where they calculated how much of the uh, cost when you're downloading a mobile website comes from the ads as opposed to from the content. This is where the problems under, this is where the problem is. And I'll, be, I'll post this on, uh, on GoStreet.com for those of you who want the presentation. Uh, so let me skip ahead because uh, the industry sort of knows, I only got three minutes, the industry knows this is a problem. And what we're trying to do at GoStreet is, is provide better transparency so businesses and consumers can make smarter decisions. So I think any of you who don't know Ghostry, it's the web's most popular consumer privacy tool. You install it on your browser for free. Shows you every company that's collecting your data, enables you to block them from tracking you, control it. Uh, we are a business, and we make money by consumers opting into anonymously shared data with us that we package into a suite of software and solutions that we sell to the, co to the companies that all of you do business with. Uh, big publishers, retail, uh, travel, banks, etc. Because back to my point of consumers and businesses having the same problem, this is what everyone here sees when you're using Ghostry. This is actually what's going on. And it's funny, if you look at that map over there, it looks pretty similar, doesn't it? Uh, so, <laughs> pure coincidence. Uh, I think we're gonna start wearing lab coats in our office, because that looks really cool. But, uh, this, is, this is that world. This is how it actually plays out. And in the same way that regular people don't really understand this, the company that owns this web page doesn't understand this either. And that's where I think you, the, success, the opportunity for success lies, because companies actually have the same incentives. Because to Andreas's point, <clears throat> you think about appealing to greed and fear. Uh, that's, that's really how you make money. It's about greed and fear, I think. Of, of my seven sins, those are my two favorite. And it's about performance, because when the web is slow, it's a bad customer experience. Many of you who work in technology know how much time your operations folks can waste trying to run down problems. And in an ecosystem that's this messed up, you waste a lot of money trying to find the problems. And then every one of these nodes of all these different companies is another opportunity for the security of your app or site to be compromised, and then ultimately the regulators come in because you need to be compliant. So that's the way we see the ecosystem and where we see the opportunities. I'm gonna take just two minutes to show you how we're going about it, and uh, what we do at times can be controversial because it's imperfect, and we know that. Uh, and in talking to regulators and others, what we find a lot is that we just have to try to be, we have to keep going. These are not perfect solutions. So this is an example of Crate and Barrel, a very popular retailer here in the United States. Uh, this is everybody who's collecting data on this page. But this is how they actually all got there. So it's very messy. And just in the same way that, uh, you know, Andreas was sending his passport an email and not sure who had access to it, <clears throat> this is everybody who has access to me when I land on this page. And this is certainly concerning because Crate and Barrel probably doesn't even know who they are. They're just trying as marketers to get the best cost of customer acquisition and to create the best user experience in terms of how they market different offers to you and try to make the website better, but it can work against you. And this is what you see when it starts working against you because now these ads go out to other places. Uh, it can slow the site down. These yellow circles are tags that are loading slow. And what we've tried to do is working with both regulators and companies is to provide better uh, notification tools. So this is uh, Reuters. A lot of you have seen this in Europe. You've seen these cookie consent buttons where we can show who's collecting data and give you the ability to opt out of it. 
Uh, this, these tools have been in production for about four years, and they're an industry standard. Imperfect, yes, but a huge step forward when you look at the speed of things like regulation and self-regulation. Uh, regulators will always be behind the market, but solutions do exist. Where, we're, where things are going next, which I think is much more interesting, uh, is in mobile. So a lot of you have probably seen uh, these ad choices icons on mobile. And so what we've been working on is deploying our technology to, cons to give consumers choice at the device level and I think ultimately at the network level. So you can install this app called App Choices, which is where it uses our technology. And we've mapped all of the different companies at the device level. And we're broadcasting, you can choose to opt out and broadcast out to them a signal of don't track me. And it's not cookie based, it's at the device level. You're going to see very soon on apps that you install and log into asking you up front for your consent and enabling you to manage your settings, both at the app level and at the device level. And where I think the world is going is enabling you to manage this at the network level as well. Because as you think about a world of IoT, and I'll wrap up on this, think about a world of IoT, you're not going to be managing your preferences on your toaster or on your refrigerator but you will be managing them, I think, through some type of app that's provided to you by one of the companies that you rely on most who has a pipe into your house, which is the manufacturer of the hardware, your telephone company, your electric utility, or your, your cable phone and internet provider. So we look into the future and we, we see this map. This map's not going to change. This map's only going to get more complex because now you're gonna add more devices and more attachment points to the network, and that's the opportunity and the challenge for all of us to do a much better job for consumers because you cannot annoy people into buying your products. Thanks. Thank you. Hope I will remember what I've written. It was two weeks ago. Okay, so it's, oh. that's. So I'm talking um, for myself. I'm a head of audience and advertising systems of News UK. So the main titles are The Times, The Sunday Times, The Sun. But I've also been working in the digital advertising uh, industry for the last 14 years. So this is um, also my personal um, uh, opinion and the and the reason why I'm here is because I truly believe that transparency and privacy is something that is uh, really needed. Um, the digital advertising um, industry is uh, at a moment where we have a lack of uh, credibility and trust. We have the issue of viewability, uh, ads that are uh, put in positions where are maybe uh, deep down the page and probably impossible to view by the user. Um, we have a problem with ad fraud, basically uh, impressions and clicks being generated by robots and not by humans. And ad blocking, which is uh, uh, the, the result of, of uh, practices of the last few years. Um, where is the crisis point? And this is mainly related to uh, ad blocking. Um, the user and the media owner um, have a relationship. Uh, the user visits the website and, and uh, uh, consumes the content because it's interested in it. It's, it's uh, uh, leveraging the information. And, uh, and this used to be a, a, a tight relationship. Um, advertising then uh, developed a, a relationship between the advertiser, the media agency, and the media owner. So using uh, uh, the media owner, so the website, as a, as a channel to reach the user. But at some point, um, and this didn't happen uh, uh, all in, 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 in one go, uh, ad tech, has been growing and growing and growing, and as somehow um, 
broken this relationship, um, which then uh, generated the, the need of uh, ad blocker or content blockers, and therefore also interrupted the relationship between advertiser media agency and media owner. So uh, the perceived benefits of ad blocking, uh, we have already seen them, are better user experience, uh, faster page loading, less data consumption, and improved privacy. How do we fix it from a, a publisher perspective? I think we need to reestablish the dialogue with the user. We have, in, in News UK, we have uh, different uh, situations where, for example, the Times is fully behind a paywall, so you need to, to, to pay a subscription in order to access the content, while the Sun from the 1st of December will be um, completely free. But still, is, is a dialogue with your own user. Uh, these users are visiting us because they believe in what we write, they believe in the journalists, they believe in quality content, and, and, and a, a dialogue with, with the user needs to be reestablished, also related to, to digital advertising. Best practices, I was uh, working in ad technology 12 years ago, and 12 years ago we were talking about best practices like having a close button, having a skippable video, having uh, the sound off by default, having uh, no autoplay, et cetera, et cetera. We have um, forgotten all this. Um, we need to rediscover the creativity of advertising. Uh, programmatic, I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but is, 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 is the, the hot uh, uh, term in, in digital advertising, has moved the focus from creativity and value to the user uh, and to the advertiser to the channel. We see programmatic advertising, we see the platform as the goal rather than a channel, uh, which is what effectively is, and creating value, crafting advertising and, and working with advertisers and users to, to, to provide the best um, possible advertiser for that specific audience. Um, and improving media owners' knowledge. Um, when I say um, and vetting and testing ad tech, sorry, because I don't remember, okay. So uh, when I say improving media owners' knowledge and vetting and testing ad tech, because um, um, looking also at the presentation before, um, a, a huge problem that I see today uh, with the growth of ad tech is that we have so many companies Every, every day, every week, every month, new companies, new startups coming to us, telling us that they will improve our revenue, increase our revenue, just put uh, your, our tag on your pages, and so on and so on and so on. What I find and what I see from the days when I was working at Tech to today when I'm working with a publisher, uh, that uh, the knowledge of the publisher has created um, is, is not uh, keeping up to speed with the industry, and this imbalance between ad tech and the knowledge of the publisher is creating a lot of, uh, 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 is adding a lot of rubbish to, to, to our pages. Um, having said that, um, what I would like to say, looking at the presentation, at the great presentations that I've seen in these uh, last two days, um, it would be really a mistake demonizing digital advertising. Um, a web without digital advertising will probably be a subscription-based web. Um, it's, we need to work as, as, as DTL to improve knowledge and visibility within the industry to be able to create more uh, user-centric solutions, but always remembering that advertising is what allows us to uh, have uh, free websites and free apps. Thank you. Thank you, Alessandro. Hey. You're on. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, are you supposed to? No. Nope. 
I can, no, this is not. Is this the biggest one? Oh, that's mine. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. OK, thank you. So I'm going to try to stick to my three, five minutes. Uh. So my name is Matt Travisano. I'm the founder and CEO of Grant Data. Basically, what we do is cross-industry data monetization. We, as, as there was this, this idea of that you have to break up the silos within a company and integrate all the data to provide more value for the company. Well, we are doing kind of the same, but with industries. So we are taking all the data from one industry and give value to another industry. Uh, so what's, that's what my company does, uh, but I'm more interested in here, and I want to tell you very quickly what we do, but always uh, keep that in mind that what I'm really interested in pushing here the conversation to, uh, towards, it's like I really believe that all the, the data discussion is more about freedom, it's more about how we are going to be controlled in the future, not that much about advertisement. So uh, that's are the questions that I would like to discuss. And also, I really believe that uh, social good is like a, a very powerful Trojan horse, both to push companies to share data and also to engage with end users, with consumers, with people in the end, both to make them aware how valuable their data is, but also to loop them into the solution. So very quickly, uh, this is our grand data, uh, privacy preserving data monetization ecosystem. So I, I'll put it, I'll, I'll make it more concrete. So data partners, we partner with a lot of companies, but just, let's just say uh, uh, Telcos, Telcos provide, provide their data to us, anonymous data. Our customers, let's just say a bank, also provides data to us. Social Universe is our platform that basically integrates all the data. We process all the data and provide value to our customers. So the, our customers pay us and we rev share part of that money back to our data partners. So by doing so, we are generating new revenue, new money out of the data assets to the, the data partners. Okay, so that, that's basically how it works. Uh, but I want to discuss two things with you guys. So the first is what are our privacy by design, and second is how we can use the platform and the privacy by design things that we have put together to use this for social good and ultimately to improve the awareness and, and help people to to be more accountable of what they're doing with their data. So first, all the data that we are getting is anonymous. Uh, both the data partners, say the telcos and the banks are an arm's uh, length from each other. We never give back to the customers any uh, individual uh, answer. All, all, every data, every value that we provide, provide to our customers is aggregated. We enforce all, all the subscribers' rights and also comply with local regulations. So the, the question that I'm that I'm starting to, 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 to ask, and I want to share them with you, is we are doing a lot of things for social good within, within uh, our for-profit company. But now I want, to, I want to use all this technology, all these uh, uh, business uh, rules and business model that we put together for, for Grand Data for social good. So the questions that I have is, how, should we open source the platform? how we can engage with customers in a way that we can make them more aware how their, their data is being used. And don't you want to know that your data is being useful for the Bill and Melinda Gates and MIT to include more people into the financial system? Uh, don't you want to know that we are using your, your data to understand the gender issues that's going on in, in, under, uh, in underdeveloped countries? So all those things are things that are questions that somehow are Trojan horse and to spark a deeper conversation about what do you want to do with your data uh, and, and, and in the end, uh, how you want to engage uh, with companies and with people in the future. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Paolo Ciuccarelli. I'm, I'm a designer, actually. I'm a communication designer, probably the only one in the room, right? Any other designer here? Two. Oh, good. Well, um, I work at Politecnico di Milano, where I'm an associate professor, and um, where I founded 10 years ago a research lab that works on creating interfaces for make data more usable and accessible. And when we succeed on that, I think it's because design is essentially a human-centric discipline. And uh, it means that the human being, not the object or the interface, is at the center of the design activity. And uh, more precisely, is the experience or the journey, thanks to Jose for the word, <laughs> that the user has with the data that should be at the center of our activity. And uh, yesterday we talked a lot about uh, awareness. And in my opinion, awareness is much more than just understanding what's going on with the data is understanding and establishing also a rich, continuous, passionate relationship with it, with the data. And so it's, it's a journey, it's an experience, and it's about emotion and empathy. And that's, again, it's a very natural territory for design, at least since 10 years or more. So what I'm saying here is that industry needs design if you want to go on on this discourse. Um, well, this is a tool. <laughs> Oh, okay, this is not the right presentation. <laughs> uh, okay, but I will play with it. So, <laughs> there are many ways design can help uh, in, in, this, in building, uh, let's say, a, a user experience, a journey with the data that also address the empathy and the emotion that has been raised also by, with the first presentation. Um, this is an example. This is a tool we designed uh, two years ago that is under developing. It's a web-based open source tool that anybody can use for creating customized charts from spreadsheets. And people loved it immediately. And uh, the reason why they loved it is more for what, uh, it's not for what it does, there are many options, but how it does it. And if we look at uh, the words that people use to describe the experience they're having with this tool, they use words like love, passion, uh, easy, uh, and enjoyable, this kind of words. And, um, and the funny thing is that this was not intentional. We designed a tool that was meant to be useful at first for ourselves, and then we ended up, I think, as designers, to naturally design something that was also a pleasurable experience for some, someone else. That's what I mean with user experience. And that's something that happened, let would say, naturally. And I mean, it, it has been shortlisted in, in Innovation by Design Awards, and the, the, the word they use to describe this tool is elegant. You can imagine an elegant tool to be used by people. And that's why I think also Floodwatch, that is one of the tools we have now in this industry, is working quite well because the user experience has been designed by designers or something like that. Well, this is another example. Uh, the user experience can be to father, and uh, what if we transform the relationship with data into a game experience? This is a game designed by our students. And it's a guess who revisited, I would say. You have to guess the identity of a person uh, according to the data points that are collected from the web in real time and printed into some kind of a dossier uh, specifically designed for that. Or other example, this is playing with uh, aesthetics and language. We can play with uh, rhetorics, for example, or visual metaphors and try to explain what a tracker is, as we did in this booklet that we designed together with the Digital Methods Initiative in Amsterdam at the Citizens Data Lab. And this book has been featured in, in a museum as a kind of a piece of art, but it explains how a tracker works and what happens if it works and what are the consequences. Just using metaphors, and the metaphors here is a, the, a kind of a living organism that has been used consistently throughout all the pages of the booklet. And this is another example. This is how we, we tried to make public a bunch of data set that we scraped from a, a website of a car, a car sharing operator in Milano. And uh, we wanted to make public this phenomenon in a way because it was spreading. And we used aesthetics in order to convey the, this data. And uh, we built a website that has got a lot of attention, but just because of the way data have been you know, designed, I would say. This is why also the Fertron reports got a lot of attention. Oh, what, what happens if you try to end the design by hand some kind of personal data, like uh, the folks behind Dear Data? Dear Data, that's an interesting title. 
are, are, are doing in this project? Well, there is a dark side we have to fight with this kind of joyful experiences and is, uh, in my opinion, the, 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 the image, the public image of privacy and anonymity. Uh, last year, we collected words and pictures from the web in order to reconstruct the public image of anonymity. And you can imagine, this is the image of anonymity on the web. It's very dark, it's totally black, and these are the kind of characters that emerge from the web when you talk about anonymity. And it's the same if you, if you search for uh, videos that are related to the deep web. This is what you get. So it's very dark, it's in a way impressive. So th that's why I think people don't have a good idea of the deep web. It's called dark web because, I mean, highlighting that it can be used for the bad, but hiding on the same time the many good purposes that it could serve. And what about the, the black phone by Silent Circle? It's private by design, but it's also black by design. That, that's a choice. And this is a website to promote a, a black phone for privacy, you know? Well, so I was a bit surprised when I saw the result of this context. Uh, crypto design challenge was meant to make more public cryptography. It's a complex concept, isn't it? And uh, to uh, explain people how it works and why it's good cryptography, it could be good. And the winner is uh, a color that hearts you with an elect electric pulse whenever you visit a website that is not fa safe, you know. <laughs> so, uh, that's, do you think it's the good way to approach the thing? Is it enjoyable? <laughs> is it, but it, it's, I mean, it got the award. Um, so that's why I think that it's probably better to nudge people with uh, gentle, enjoyable, pleasurable experiences with privacy, personal data, instead of, you know, pushing a kind of a Pavlovian approach to, to, to these issues. Thanks a lot. Um, that's actually a really good uh, talk for me to follow because the work that I want to show you is along the same lines. I run a studio in New York called the Office for Creative Research. Um, I'm here, and Genevieve is over, over here from the OCR, and, and one of our um, one of our central research questions is, what is the human experience of, of data? And, and a metaphor that I often use is air travel, I think, for two reasons. First of all, when you cross that TSA line in the airport, you relinquish control. You lose agency. You're told what to do and where to go. You're touched inappropriately. Um, a lot of things that you wouldn't normally allow in your everyday life. And then the second big thing in air travel is that you're part of a system that's unimaginably complex. It's too complex for our puny human brains to understand. At any given time, there are more than a million people in the air. This visualization is a, a visualization of that kind of respiring system as airplanes land and take off and land and take off. So this idea of human experience of data, how can we make it easier for people to live within, within these data systems? Because that's, in the end of the day, what we're constructing. We're, we're constructing systems that people are going to need to live inside of. Um, I thought I'd show this because there's been a lot of discussion about the ad tech ecosystem this morning. We built this visualization three years ago in conjunction with um, uh, John Battelle. It's called Behind the Banner. And it, I think it's a pretty good explanation of how that crazy Lumiscape thing actually unfolds. You can um, find it on our website if you want to watch that afterward. But actually, I want to talk about a different project. Um, I teach it at ITP in New York City, which is kind of like the punk rock version of this place. Um, you could fit it inside of this room, and it's much sturdier. Um, and one of my students there, Julia Irwin, came up with this project where she showed her, she, she came up with this idea that she would show the web ads that people were being presented on the websites, and then she would get strangers to write a story about them based on those web ads. I thought this was such a great idea, and, and I, I was in the middle of development on a project which allowed me to collect every single web ad that I was exposed to. So this is all my web ads from one month. Um, and I, I sent those to Mechanical Turk and paid people $10 to write stories about me. And the idea here was, was could I understand through this type of reverse engineering what happens, um, what, what are these web identities that, that are um, used for advertising, what are they encoding? Somebody said, like, you know, there's an exchange 
that says that it's exchanging your data with, with advertisers, but it's actually not you. It's some weird um, picture of you that is inaccurate and, 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 and kind of strange. Um, everyone thought I was in my 30s and I lived alone and I played video games. I'm happy to say that none of those things are true. So this tool that we um, built is called Floodwatch, and the idea of Floodwatch is really simple. It allows the user to see the ads that are being shown to them. We don't do any fancy algorithmic computation on it. We just say, here are the ads that, that you are being shown. And it allows the user to say, what are the things that people um, believe about me that, that they've constructed through this weird process of picking up pieces of data detritus that I've, um, that I've left behind. And, and you can install um, Floodwatch at, at floodwatch.ocr.org. Um, but really the idea here is, is, is about producing a tool that is about collective action. Uh, um, there's two problems with, I think, our conversation about privacy. The first thing is that it's like a bunch of people who look like us talking in rooms that look like this about privacy. Um, and it's not people in the communities that are most affected by these things. If we talk about the damage that web advertising can do, it's all about discrimination. And discrimination, of course, affects the underpowered and under underprivileged. Those are people who have zero voice today. They have zero voice in our conversation, and, and what can we do about that? And so what, we, what we're trying to do with Floodwatch is build a tool that it's kind of a model for collective action. Because the other thing that individuals can do other than see their ads is they, they can um, donate their data to researchers who are specifically trying to look at advertising malpractice. And, and I think uh, the, other, the main thing that is exciting about this is that it actually um, gives people a view at how bad the, these systems are, how, how, how poorly they work. There's a dialogue around surveillance that is built on, upon this idea that it works. And, and the, it, it doesn't. It's, it's bad. It, and it's, it, it's not very um, accurate. And, and we do ourselves a disservice if all of our conversation is about blocking and all of our conversation is about exclusion. And some of that conversation should be, should be direct criticality about how inefficient and how um, um, sort of, I think, basically wrong a lot of these um, algorithmic techniques can be. Anyways, that's Floodwatch. Please install it. And I enjoyed our conversations. So, <clears throat> I think that that's the moment. I think that we are amazed by the, the quality of the presenters and the presentations. And uh, without further ado, let's open the, the, the turn to the public, to, to the audience, to, to ask questions. Bala, to go first. So a question to the Ghostry gentleman. Uh, I noticed that when you went to that website that you, um, whatever the crate and barrel one, and it said it was whitelisted. Yeah. Do you have a set of sites that you whitelist by default, and do you take money from them for doing that? No, that's, that's, uh, you guys hear me okay? Okay. You guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, no. <laughs> Let me, th there's another company in our space that, uses a different business model than ours, which we don't agree with, and I'll stop there. Uh, the whitelisting function is for any individual user, because what we find is the way people use Ghostry is that very few of them just turn off all forms of data collection, because it breaks the internet, and not all tracking is bad by any means. What we typically see is people, uh, privacy is so subjective and situational, they will say, these are the sites I visit all the time, they're on my whitelist. And when I'm doing something that is new, maybe not safe for work, or my example is when I'm shopping for a car, I don't feel like being stalked by car ads, then I will uh, you know, use more blocking. Thank you for asking. OK. More questions? Anyone? I guess it's a little like the first question I asked in the keynote, but. We hear people t telling us about how ads is going to collapse you know, next week, uh, uh, or other people that are completely cynical and say, no, no worries, uh, the ad ecosystem is always going to survive, and we'll have these terrible ads. No one, you know, everyone say no one click on them, but you're wrong. People click on them. We're going to make a lot of money. I'm just very curious to know what you think. OK. So um, <laughs> can I, can, uh, Alexander? Um, I would say there are two elements. One is the ad itself, and one is the, the tool that delivers the ad in front of the 
right user or supposedly right user. So I think, um, as I was mentioning before, uh, we need to go back to best practices, so to non-intrusive ads. Um, and on the other end, and I liked the, the point on how inaccurate uh, user profiling is, we need to work on a better and more, again, user-centric, as in a use of data that really benefits the user. 90% um, I think that the digital advertising uh, industry is using third-party data that is always very often uh, good at aggregate level, not at individual level, based on census, based on postcode, so not based on the individual, um, which results in, in, we have studies where uh, the outcome was that is better random, <laughs> randomly target the ad to anybody than using those bad um, third party data. On the other hand, I'll, I'll make the example of the times. Um, a very sought after by advertisers uh, um, segment, uh, of, of an audience segment very sought, uh, sought after by advertisers is uh, high net worth individuals. So 90% of the industry will use third-party data, which tells you the income of the user, the income band, which again is, is, is almost random, is based on census, uh, and we know how, uh, especially in certain countries, real estate is, is moving so fast that, that how old is that data? Anyway, um, we are profiling the user based on, on the content consumption uh, uh, related to, for example, for high net worth individuals, uh, luxury, uh, travel, golf, yachts, um, this type. So we are inferring. Uh, and, and, and if this, in my opinion, if this is done um, with the knowledge of the user and respecting the user, respecting the, the user experience and respecting the privacy of the user, so without this data then going all over the place, all over the internet, then that's, that's a good digital advertising, in my opinion. And we need to be very careful not to mix, uh, we, we are talking about data and privacy as if there was one type of data. So one thing is my passport being sent and potentially intercepted. And one thing is me reading an article about how to make uh, homemade ice cream. Um, so we need to be very mm, careful in not putting everything in, a, in, in the same bucket, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that there was, there was, there was something on the, um, uh, on the space. When we were doing the landscape analysis for DTL a year ago, we came across uh, some folks that were doing um, analysis and what was the actual uh, fear factor or scariness factor of, of us being profiled as users and um, in, in the surveys they conducted, it turned out that most people would be comfortable by being shown ads of TVs when you are purchasing a TV because you're shopping for it. So one thing that the advertising industry as a whole is trying to, to infer, you would be willing for a period of time to provide <laughs> willingly. So you've got this great imbalance. Someone is trying to get something out of you anyway, and you're able or unwilling to provide it yeah. in some situations and some conditions, but never asked to, to provide that information. So uh, and how do you put those, thing, those two things together? Absolutely. And quality content, quality apps, quality websites cost money. And that doesn't fall from the sky. So we need to decide, do we want to pay for a subscription and having a subscription-based subscri internet, or do we want to make digital advertising better? There was a mention that um, 22 million people have subscribed to Adblocker and obviously they're sending a message that they would not like to, you know, they'd like to have 100% privacy. And it just seems to me why, you know, we're talking about 
add privacy and respect and all these things that just in the, the world we live in with all the greed and what have you, I just can't see that happening so easily. So I'm thinking it's, it's, there's a space here for someone like Amazon to go to Mozilla or Firefox and contract out a browser that is 100% private for Amazon customers who are prime customers like they're doing with everything else. What's to prevent something like that from happening? And then you have 100% privacy, so to speak, at least you think you do, um, and no, no ads, all content, and it'd be like a marriage made in heaven. Am I missing something? Uh, I, I think <clears throat> there was a service that existed like that. It was really popular. It was called America Online. And that's exactly, you just described AOL in the 90s. And the challenge is the cost of closed systems almost always fail unless they can maintain a complete end-to-end -end lock on the experience. The only really effective closed system out there is Apple. So I think when you look at where the money is actually made in advertising, uh, it, it, I think the idea of an Amazon super private browser is a very, very smart one. But the, the, I think the challenge you have, and we've had a lot of conversations about this, is how do you quantify who gets paid on the publisher side? Because there's also a legal concept, which is if the browser <clears throat> or any piece of technology in the United States in particular gets in the way of the media owner and the business relationship they have to sell the ads, that real estate, it belongs to the publisher, not to the consumer or to the browser. And so if Amazon steps in the middle and starts charging, and it's taking money from the consumer and interfering with that transaction between the advertiser and the publisher, now you have a, a major legal problem. And that's why I think you'll, you'll see it being so challenging for companies that could certainly afford to do it well to wade into it. It's a little bit like a Kindle. Like a what? It's like a Kindle. Like a Kindle. Like a Kindle. Yeah. Like a Kindle. No, he was mentioning the Kindle sample, of course. The Silk browser within Kindle, it is kind of a closed system. I'm not sure I agree, but that's, I hear you going. But, but in, in terms of, of Kindle, that you know they've they've dominated copyrights and and books and textbooks, and they're they've you know Baron, um, all, all these companies like uh, um, have gone out of business that were selling books retail are now it's just Amazon's dominated this, and now you have e-reading and. So why couldn't we have the publisher being forced and the advertiser to consent to Amazon's model, so to speak? Well, you in, could. In, in this super kind of, of web where if 22 million people were willing to opt in to ad blocker, you've got quite a sizable market waiting to happen. And with the tantalizing things that Amazon can do, they certainly can make money on the other end and pay the advertiser but pay much less because they're forcing the issue. That's what I'm driving at. I'll do a quick response to that, why I disagree. Uh, I think the first part is that um, do you want all those individual publishers to go out of business? You think people were bummed out when their local bookstore went under? Imagine if your newspaper, your, the, whatever content you depend on goes under. Uh, it takes a playing field that's level and tilts it in a very, very <laughs> scary way that it gets into much bigger social issues than where your books are retailed. And you know, I, I worked at the New York Times for eight years, so I, I feel there's a need to keep a level playing field. Um, that's the first piece. The other part that I'd, I'd, um, I'd argue back is that you're presuming that ads are bad. And if your, Amazon, your Amazon experience today is filled with ads. They're just better at it than everybody else. They're, they're the very best advertisers. Your, your Amazon experience, I, when I was at the New York Times, we were out at a meeting in Amazon. This was. 15 years ago, and I'll never forget this moment where I was there with a bunch of editors from the Times and business side, you know, MBA evil suits like me. And we're talking with the Amazon guys who are all evil MBA suits like me. And they're talking about the, con we're showing web pages and talking about things, and they're talking about the content, the content, the content. The editor's like, what do you mean the content? That's all ads. And the Amazon guy's like, what are you talking about? It's content. And we, we, we went and had this circular conversation for about a half hour. That's the situation you're dealing with. But again, uh, uh, Amazon is not the New York Times, and they are two completely different web destinations. Um, and, and the risk, I think, is also uh, to um, mix a bad use of technology and data 
with digital advertising. Right. There are best practices, there is good data. Unfortunately, there is a, a, a path that many in the digital advertising sector are going uh, down towards, which is bad practices and bad data, which are publishers uh, with higher and higher uh, revenue targets, having to fill the page with more and more and more ads, uh, ad tech needing to grow very quickly so that they, are, they get bought or, or, or they get uh, additional funding, and so on. So, so I think the technology <coughs> is good. Uh, we need more best practices, better data, and, uh, and, and potentially to, f to fix some of the issues like programmatic and, and so on. DTL could have. So let me, add, uh, let me add to the. I'm sorry. Okay. Just, just a second, Bala. Do you think that uh, DTL could have a positive effect on that, on the choices, on the choices that publishers make on specific technologies or on specific ad exchanges, which are more prone to have the kind of bad practices by kind of guiding or, or, or marking some of the technologies as being more prone to deliver Absolutely. quality ads and quality yeah. privacy protection? Absolutely, and, and the only remark that I would uh, make to the great presentations that we have seen these uh, two days is we need to take into consideration the web economy and, 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 and be able to differentiate what is good data, what is bad data, what, what is data that should be collect, that could be collected by a good player versus um, the, the underlying impression that uh, uh, digital advertising is evil, uh, that we should, it, uh, should shut it down, um, which is um, sometimes understandable, but it would lead to a, a web uh, of, of paid for destination. Yeah, and I think that that is, that is uh, what we want to, to avoid. So. It uh, would be good to have more viewpoints like Alessandra has represented in future, f future details. I just want to follow on, on the ad block things. There's a lot of misperceptions. I'd like to correct at least a couple of, couple of them. Uh, the 22 million number is sort of a superset. It's not clear what fraction of people are using it on a daily basis, what fraction of advertisements are actually blocked. And the sites that really care about it already know that they are being blocked. Four years ago, even small websites were able to put a banner saying that you're using ad block, you'll have to turn it off if you want to use this. So it's just a continuous the cat and mouse game. So I don't believe that 22 million people are actually getting quote unquote 100% privacy or anything close to that. So I think we need to keep this cat and mouse game in mind constantly because $150 billion of the online industry, they're not gonna roll over and wander away simply because a bunch of people in a room sit here and pontificate. No offense to anyone, including myself, but I think this is uh, real money behind this and you need to follow the money if you're gonna really try to make progress. And you know what a very interesting situation is that in this ad blocking debate between the ad blocking companies and the publishers, and the advertisers, we still make exactly the same mistake. We forget the user. So uh, the publishers will think, how do I uh, get through the ad blocker? The ad blockers think, how do I block the ads? And, and at the end, it's always the user that is, is the one getting beaten up. Um, Ger, Paolo, any, any specific experience you've had in what may work better or worse to to engage the customers or to make them react in a, in a way or another, like get less protective or comfortable with uh, any tried and tested experiences you can I share? Mean, I, agree with some, I agree with a lot of things that have been said. Uh, I think there's like a lot of um, like kids who grew up wanting to be spies who now work on ad tech and they love this idea of like trying to do these complex things to find out that I wear glasses when in fact asking me if I wear glasses is a much better way of of doing that, and that like that whole idea of user centric design, which has been the 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 buzzword in design everywhere else, needs to move in into this space. Um, and I, I I think that there's like there's we can talk about inconvenience a lot, but we, there's also some dangerous things happening right now. One of the things that I find really troubling is that um, because the public maybe the business perception of ad targeting is so good, there's other <laughs> segments that are starting to use it like. Um, uh, insurance, for example. Well, a lot of insurance agencies are using similar tech to decide whether you should be insured or not. 
And it's bounced upon the same pile of shaky bullshit that the ad tech um, um, uh, system is made up on. And when those types of decisions are being made, that isn't about whether I get, I'm wearing glasses or not, but instead about whether or not I get insured or at what price I get insured, I find that kind of terrifying. And the challenge of the DTL, I, I guess, is to find the diamonds in the pile of bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a very the good uh, needle in the haystack. T-shirt, <laughs> make the T-shirt. Yeah. Uh, right. I have a sign from Ramon. Does okay, that's a question. Hello? Yes, uh, I have a sign from Ramon. I have to ask my question. Uh, it's actually quite related to what you said. I'd like to stop talking about ads, stop to talk about tracking and privacy for one minute. Uh, what we have behind, and I would be very curious to hear from the panel what you think, uh, we have a system of big data that makes discrimination uh, between people. Part of discrimination is good. If you are in danger, uh, you need to be given a particular product in recommendation to your particular condition. That seems like the right thing to do. There's a lot of abuse of that, uh, and we're going to see this more and more. And I think, you know, I'm personally not too con I mean, right now, not too concerned about how online advertising is tracking me, but I'm very concerned about how underpowered population uh, or people that may not have the same uh, uh, data as me could be sort of discriminated against. Uh, so in five years, uh, maybe we'll have solved the ad problem, maybe not. Uh, what will happen when there will be much more personalization on tons of algorithm? And how do you see in your industry this not becoming a sort of, you know, big Pandora box for making overpowered people, mm. exploiting underpowered people. If I, if I may oh, add something. Oh. Uh, well, I'm quite an optimist in, in the technological side. I mean, I, I think you will be able to find all the algorithms and then the platforms and the tools that, that we need. Um, I mean, that's not my field, but I, I'm optimist. But I think that what is much more difficult, I think, in my opinion, is to create this relationship with the user. I think it is difficult. It is not something that comes from technology, not something that comes from data. It comes from a real relationship with, the, with, with people. And uh, nowadays, I think we are, as in many other sectors and many other industries that are based on data, we are pretty much close to the data and to the technology. And we speak the same language of data and technology. I mean, it's not by chance that the first visualizations you see about this kind of data is a graph. Do you know how much difficult is it for a lay person to understand a graph? Yeah. A graph is mathematic, you know, transformed into something graphical. But it's really difficult. It's based on spatialization algorithms that people don't get. So it's, it's really complex. You know, and and that's, that's the way we try to express, to convey something to people but it's far, far away from what people can really understand. So yesterday we talked more about awareness, but I think it's something that also industry needs. It's not yeah. just for policymakers. Yeah. Awareness is no. this deep relationship that is emphatic, this is emotional, and that's something that's... Yeah. There's, there's, there's an angle that we, we've to, explored. To have a healthy yeah. things, but it's yeah. much, much more difficult than closer, but because... Yeah. The, the social good angle we have explored in some, in, in, yeah. in, my, in my previous experience, but, but Matt, you, you've got yeah. any, any feeling of the reaction of users to, to being well, exposed to the fact that data can be used for, for actually improving our transportation systems or the yeah. cities around us? Yeah, what I like about uh, advertisement at this point is that somehow it's a lab, as my point of view, it's a lab for what the real significant battles in the future are going to be. Because a lot of data, it's, uh, it's been digitalized. Um, a lot of, it's a good environment in where data plus algorithms impact in a very efficient way some portion of our attention. Uh, so I really think that it's a battlefield, sorry for the war <laughs> metaphor, but it's a place in which a lot of the, the future challenges are being played out, right? And how we as individuals let them show, uh, show them ads which are relevant or not, which are a little bit insignificant, right? It's a, it's a, a lab. Uh, like a manifestation of the, the battles of the future. And in that sense, I, I really believe that uh, in this idea that uh, data plus algorithms equals control or like predictability and predictability <laughs> equals control and control is something in most cases bad or the being 
potentially in control is bad. So that's why I think that what's been played here is the, the first version of a new way to, to protect our freedom in the end. Um, and that's also what I think that uh, the social good um, use cases, to put it somehow, it's a good way to engage citizens and make them aware of what's been taking Yeah, I, uh, I just have to react place. to that because uh, uh, you know, it's an interesting battlefield that experiment. Uh, we've been we, talking about this for a while. With data, but you know, uh, it's not too much experimental uh, to observe in our, in our experiment. We, we wanted for privacy reason to understand which email was used by each ad in Google. And then we discovered that they are predatory targeting on uh, payday loans that targeted population at risk. And then you know, the whole project became something completely different. We don't care about privacy. We just care about actual concrete harm uh, you know, some population through ads being being given bad products uh, and suffering from it. Uh, yeah. And and I think in in the future we'll have to really face this big problem. You know, what what are we doing that is actually reinforcing the bias and the exploitation of some of the population? I'm just wondering how the yeah. industry think of this problem as a whole. That's that's the reason why I'm asking. Yeah. So, yeah, the reason why. Um, Floodwatch was developed in the first place. We wor worked in conjunction with Ashkan Sultani, who is a privacy researcher and now is um, with the FTC. And, and part of their problem with lobbying is that there, you need to build a, a body of evidence to support it. And so um, we, know, we know that there are discriminatory practices happening in web advertising, and we've been able to investigate those discriminatory practices in a very small scale. And so the idea of Floodwatch was, can we put together a large enough database that we could, we could demonstrate these things are happening at a bigger scale? And, and you know, evidence gathering is, you know, in data is power, and, and, and um, gathering that evidence is, is um, I think, is a first step. And, and, and we don't, because we don't have any evidence right now other than um, very small studies and things with headless browsers and so on and so on. So the, the, that, to me, that's one of the most important, the, it's a twofold thing. It's can we, can we bring this problem into, into culture? And so we've been trying to work with Floodwatch to build curricula that come into high schools so that people can learn about this stuff in high school. And then the second thing is, can we build a body of evidence that, that, well, that researchers can actually act on and that that can bring, be made into policy? Policy is not going to change based on some good, um, well-meaning um, yes. people. It's going to change based on, on on something that happens in a court somewhere. I think I agree. Yeah. 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 I think so. that that is perfectly in, on the spot of what we're trying to do here. Yeah. Right? Provide oh. that evidence so that the researchers can further build on that and then trick it to the policymaker. Right. So. Uh, so I have to completely disagree with you. And I'm going to take, make two points. The first one is that you're making a presumption that all forms of advertising elsewhere somehow are pristine, perfect, non-discriminatory, and work all the time which is wrong, it's false, okay? It's wildly inefficient, massively. When did we make that presumption? Well, that was what his point was. Because, let me get to the second point of it is then, therefore, the internet should be perfect. The internet's never gonna be perfect. There will be discriminatory practices. The reason the FTC exists is because markets fail. Markets are always going to fail. And you have to make a specific trade-off of, do you ask the regulators to make very prescriptive rules at the beginning to try to determine how an industry evolves, or do you let the industry evolve and have the government be a part of the conversation to fill in when markets fail. And those are really, f they're like completely fundamental philosophies and they're different. And you know, when you're here in the People's Republic of Cambridge, you're gonna view the government should set these rules, it'll be decided in a court. I think what is happening, and the reason I asked the question uh, at the beginning is there's four or five people in this room who actually ex who see what it's like out there in terms of working with, with advertisers. And there's a presumption, A, that everything else they do in other media is perfect, which is, couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, and the second one is that they're, they're evil. No, they're, they're just trying to use the technology as efficiently as you can, because you can see Fenway Park out the window here. Right? Look at all the ads that you, are, you see when you're sitting at a Red Sox game. Right? And it's a great place. Not, they're all the most of them are wasted. Right? There's a ginormous Bank of America ad. There's a huge Ford ad. Well, I'm not buying a car, and I've banked with Bank of America for 15 years, and I'm not changing. Is that a waste? Uh, is it evil? You could make the same argument, because then why is Bank of America not targeting in the right? Because going to a Red Sox game is really expensive, and walking down the street is free. So 
uh, I think that what you, so, okay, great, so now I've slammed you guys and been sort of a dick about it, but the, so what is, what's the good part of this? I think the good part is, is really what, what Alex is saying is that how do you create the right incentives? And I think that um, the best way to create the right incentives is that the market is, is pretty ruthless out there about separating the winners from the losers. And when you talk, the, and so you, the, this, with success levels, I think creating a, a certain amount of tolerance for things not being perfect, because uh, it won't be perfect. And it's not perfect, I worked, again, you're working in journalism. Journalism is massively important. And those guys make mistakes. There's a correction section every single day. And no one there is trying to use technology to do something evil, but they make mistakes every day. And when, if you retard the growth of brand new industries, being on the cutting edge like we are here, I personally think you're going to take <clears throat> the innovation out of it. And smart people won't work here. We would all be doing something else. I, I think. We're, we're, we need to maybe settle on what I mean by discriminatory practice. So, uh, you know, there's clear examples of um, advertising that targets African Americans for riskier credit cards than oh, yeah. other demographics. On television. You can, and on the web. And in mail. And so. For 50 years. But you're saying that, that, that people should get a pass from that. No, 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 I'm not saying you should get a pass from that at all. The whole Federal Trade Commission exists to hammer on people to, to do that, but for those examples, you shouldn't shut down an entire industry because bad things happen. Nobody's asking to shut down the advertising industry. What we're asking for is a model that can, that can promote accountability. That's all, that's all that anybody is looking okay, so, for. So no, in, nobody is. You know, I get this argument a lot when we present Floodwatch that like, we have to be careful to talk about how bad the targeting ad, uh, ad targeting is because you know, we're going to risk affecting this industry that employs a lot of people. Like, you guys just have to do better. Accountab accountability is a good word, um, but again, I think we are using the bad implementation and bad use of, our, <coughs> of the technology to, 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 to infer a picture of digital advertising. When I was at Yahoo, there was no um, official outside in the industry regulation, but we wouldn't use any data uh, related to sexuality, related to right. health, related to religion, um, and we would have never discriminate, right. uh, same, discriminated the, the exact same technology. It's, it's the exact same technology that can be used for evil. The, I mean, it works the exact same way. Yeah. The exact same technology is used to give students access to loans that they desperately need. It's to promote online education that lets folks who could never afford to get educated on, uh, let's use code.org, right? And anybody who's advertising online education, really important things, access to promotion of Obamacare. Do you know how many billions of mar dollars of marketing went to a promotion of Obamacare using the exact same tech that you're so concerned about? Yeah, and so these, these, our efforts are not going to affect fair use of technology. They're going to affect unfair use of technology. But it's the same tech. So we're, we should but, not, we're a, a, gun, a, a gun could be in the hands of a policeman or, of, or, or a terrorist. And, and, and it's, it's who, who holds the gun and, and what he uses it for. I agree that we need accountability yeah. and, need, and you, yeah. we need regulation. We need, well, to go, we need to go in that direction, so, but I, we, I, we have some questions. I, I just wanted to say one word just to we, maybe just, reconcile just, because I think I agree with both of you. Uh, the word I would say is just transparency. We all agree that we don't want to shut it down, uh, but we still want this to be more transparent. And I, I totally yeah. agree with what you said, and yeah. I don't want to shut it down, Probably. I don't think it's evil. Our, our results show that actually most of the evil perception is wrong, right. it's actually not evil, but that's because it's opaque. And I just want to say that transparency yeah. is the key goal here. So uh, in, order to keep, in order to keep the stage with the audience for a bit. Um, so this is all good. Um, however, since you mentioned FTC and you mentioned wasted bandwidth, a lot of good words there. So what, would, what do you think the reaction would be if the ISPs just take all the ad traffic off the free lanes, say, if you want to use that, Go for the paid lanes. Now the FTC failed to uh, take hold of the net neutrality thing. So would, you know, how do you think that would disrupt, disrupt the ecosystem? And before you answer that, I hope the next person can also ask their questions so we don't completely lose the stage. Okay. But yeah, we, up to you. We're, we're really short in time, so there's, I think, four more questions. But we can maybe take one, yeah. one last. I'd love to talk to you about that one afterwards. Hi, this is a question slash statement. Regarding um, the discrimination issue, uh, th there's already laws and regulations in place to address that uh, the, under the, f uh, federal, uh, excuse me, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. 
which the FTC is, is being very aggressive in, in signaling to, the, to this industry that, that they are monitoring and enforcing. In addition, the self-regulatory program for online behavioral advertising also pro, uh, prohibits that activity under their, their best practices guidance, uh, which is monitored and enforced by an independent accountability agent. So, I, you know, that's a statement. So I, I'm not sure what could be done, um, uh, whether it's additional regulation or laws or, or, or different sort of monitoring and enforcement, but it's pretty actively monitored and enforced already. I mean, we would love nothing better than to do Floodwatch and have 100,000 users and make a big data set and have researchers work on it and then to come back to us and say there's no discriminatory practice happening in malpractice and everything's good and everyone's a good player. And if, if that's the case, then we've wasted a couple of years of our time and some funding from, from uh, organizations mm -hmm. and we've taught people a little bit about web advertising. And uh, so if, if you're right, then no one loses. And, and, and that's fine, like we're, we're not, you're, you're right that there are laws in place, but what we've heard directly from the FTC is that they have a challenge in gathering evidence about whether this stuff is happening or not. And, 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 and you know, it, it's, right now it's kind of up to people to say, hey, we're doing, we're doing this bad, the advertisers to say we're doing this bad thing because there's no system in place to monitor. And I'm encouraged to hear that the FTC is looking for data to validate, you know, whether or not it is happening. So, which just says to me that that is a priority issue for them to enforce. And, and this could be, I think, the, the role of the DTL, uh, because uh, it's for sure uh, uh, out there is full of cowboys, and <laughs> but we can work together. And I like the DTL because data and the user is in, in the middle and, and we all have different expertise and, yeah. and we can work to help regulators, publishers, and even ad tech, because there is a lot of a good ad tech as well out there, to um, steer the direction that unfortunately is, yeah. is being uh, taken the wrong way by, 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 by yeah. th that's, those. That's really the piece yeah. that's missing. There is no good keeping good housekeeping seal of approval yeah. that's based on objective, ongoing monitoring. Yeah. It's either complaint driven when someone makes a mistake or it's an attestation where someone says yeah. once a year, yeah, I'm a good guy, yeah. come find me if I screw up. People screw yeah. up all the time. I think the detail, especially with the members of it is, and we're happy to provide the data because we see that's we see all the all of the ecosystem. So that's, that's fantastic. I think that this is, this is yeah. a good cl closing point. Like, we need to work together. We, we are here to work together. So we, we have the chance now to collect all these ideas, feed them into the research track, and work with you guys that you see a lot of things happening in the actual reality checked stuff that is happening. And use those, the insights from those explorations and those, those uh, uh, findings uh, and feed them into reports that can help policymakers. Mm -hmm. Because those are standards to the point that was made earlier, uh, your point about the ISPs. Well, if the ISPs, and what, what Andreas was saying before, if the ISP said, here's a set of objective criteria. If your tags fail X percent of the time, if they are running non-secure, if we see you transmitting unencrypted data in your headers, all of which is objective, not subject. The reason I went after you guys is that's a subjective call. And you can't build an industry if it's all subjective. But objective things like that, very powerful, extremely powerful, yeah. and really, really effective. Yeah. Okay, so. So, I have a question. Uh, we have talked about a lot. Oh. Hello? Yeah. So, we have talked about, about a lot of things. Uh, we have talked about emotion, we have talked about policies, but there are two main important roles that we haven't really talked about. Actually, it was talked about slightly, but uh, so my first question is that. There's money involved. There's billions of dollars involved. And the second thing is there's state level agencies involved. I mean, you need data, not just for advertisement, but for, for user profiling for other purposes, for security reasons, for example. So these are the two main factors. And even if as far as much as we emphasize on data transparency, is it really possible to take those billions, maybe even trillions, because Google and Facebook all combined are worth over a trillion dollars now over a trillion dollars and state-level agencies out of this equation? 
that's that's an interesting question. I think that there's there's no way to to know how that may unfold. Of course, those earning the money now or those making out a big business on top of the of, of the advertising would have a strong opinion about letting go some of that money, and I guess that. Um, uh, Still, they can be educated, and I think not, not all hope is lost in, in that, because of course there are good examples that you can show in which people are making money, still behaving within some set of rules that are choices, and maybe transparency, by adding transparency, we can achieve accountability and make uh, the people owning the, the web properties have better choices in when, when they choose the technology to power their websites, because those will be more transparent than others, that can be, can be equally engaged and can be decisions uh, uh, that are made at some point and no, no specific way to, to tell the, the good from the bad. And regarding data and, 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 and how to, to, to actually promote that, this is one of the reasons of being of this forum, to, to have a place where we can actually have a, a, a coordinated action to, to, to be able to put our eyes, a collective set of eyes on the data and learn new stuff about what is happening, and relay that information in a way that the world can understand, not just us in the room can understand. If I can give a suggestion to the DTL, <laughs> I, would, I would give this suggestion is to really stick on, on transparency, because I think that that's something that is a bit missing in the, mm -hmm. these two days, is a real uh, is? discussion about what transparency is. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with the language you represent yeah. the concepts with, for example, mm -hmm. and this language I think is not yet close to, to one of the stakeholders of this yeah. big system that is, that is a user. I think yeah, it's a matter of language. No, no, I, I what really kind of language you speak. And, and so, uh, but transparency is no, before, no, no. awareness is before accountability. But that is, I think, that, that is part of, of the, the work that needs to be done. It's not there yet. Like in the same sense that privacy is, is a topic as broad as as you can take it, from spy stories and NSAs and whatnot to what we experience in the browser when we are purchasing them or reading the newspaper. Privacy is all that, but we need to narrow it down to something we can understand and work on. In the same sense, when we are talking data transparency, the personal leakage of data transparency uh, or, or, or how to, to, to make it more transparent, how, how, mu how much of that data is being leaked, um, we need to, to narrow down the debate to something that is actually actionable and that, that, that is relevant to the, to the ones in the room, not so much. I mean, it is so easy to get into the data transparency slash open data, which is a, another territory. It is, it is not about what we're talking about. But it is so easy to just, by the choice of words, be on, on a different field. So I, I think that, that there is a, there's a lot to, 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 to be made on the communication side of it. I just have a comment on the last um, one. Okay, uh, we, we had the very, very yeah. last one. We are a bit late <laughs> off the scale. Good over you. This is really important though, because and yesterday we spoke with the lady from Singapore, and I asked her. I said, well, "How do you guys communicate your your ideas to the other people?" And that's the only suggestion I heard in this entire time that I've been here was town halls. Now I know that sounds, you know, almost primitive. So I'm turning to you and I'm wondering, is there a UX version of communication in terms of design in your mind that you can think of, of how you could communicate everything that we're discussing and be able to present it to the public? You mentioned already graphs is a spatial issue. That doesn't necessarily work. What's in your mind? I did just, there's something there. I don't know what it is, but is there, can you, can you, can you talk about it? I think that's, with transparency, we have to add communication, whatever that might be. I think it goes down to, again, to, um, I think, media owners, site owners being the first point of contact with the DTL, because <coughs> then at the end... All that's understood is when we finally get everything out of this room, we have to, what do we do next? How do we communicate it to the other? What, what do we next, exactly? The topic of the next session, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. But I have some so, ideas. No, I, I, just, I have some ideas. Okay. That's what so, I want to hear. Can you just say a few words on that? Just what, what's, what's on your fo on? Well, one, one idea that I, I was thinking about in, in some of the examples I show, we, we had this intent of make some of the data we were scraping from the web more public. So first, we used uh, a language that we thought was more understandable. So 
we, uh, you know, the, the way you represent the data, so the, the solution, the choices that we made was we made these choices in that, that direction, for example, using metaphors, using geography, using some kind of layers that you can link to your personal experience, to your everyday experience. A second step could be, for example, with the car sharing system, we were thinking to put these visualizations of the data in the context because, I mean, it's something that if, you, if it's about going around with a car, so why don't we speak about that there where the, the need or is, you know, you feel this need. So it's, these are some very basic ideas, but I think that's something that we have we, to we work to, with yeah. together because are, I'm not an expert of privacy. But what, we, what I know, and that's I think in terms of communication is very important, is there are, we are nowadays in between of two negative perceptions. So when we studied the web to understand what is the public perception of this phenomenon, we found a very negative perception of public image of privacy and anonymity, and on the other side, a very negative perception of all the tracking infrastructure. So if there are two negative perceptions, I think there is something we have to work for something, with. Yeah, for someone that is a, that is a data optimist like, like me, <laughs> it, is, it is crazy to see that all the, all the messages that we're bombarded continuously are mostly negative. Yeah, and, and that's and, something that we have to... It's not a very effective marketing strategy. <laughs> <laughs> it comes down to this, yeah. lack, this, part, like, I think this lack of agency. People don't feel like they are part yeah. of that conversation. And yeah. I think we need to figure out how to bring them in. And, mm -hmm. and, and yeah. it, you know, that's what, to me, like, culture exists for, to bring these types of topics into... Right into people's discussions. So, I mean, it could be, I think we're already seeing it. Like I think about like, as much as I think it's really hand-handed, like Mr. Robot, right? Like brought the conversations around privacy into the public. And, oh, yeah. and I, I, know, I think it's kind of comically facile, but on the other hand, it's like, it is getting people talking about these things. That's, and I think that that's what's gonna happen is that this, these things will come into culture and we'll. That is, that is a fantastic closing line. I think that we need to make this happen. Communication should be on the agenda for TTL going into the next year. And we should organize ourselves through uh, the, the means that we have here uh, to, to actually have some deliverable pieces of communication that we can all go ahead and, and, and deliver to the different target. Okay. Ah, to, to, of course, to different. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so with, with that, we, we need to close. We're out of time. Thank you very much for uh, coming here today. Thank you to all of the panelists. Uh,